Okay, we are live in Be A Boss. We'll give it a couple seconds, let a few people join in. Okay, I see us in the group. We're actually on time this week. This is a great achievement from three top ops bosses. <laughs> <laughs> were we not on time last time? I thought we were on time. Were I we? Think so. All right. I think we were. Elizabeth keeps us on track. It's I do. It's moving along. <laughs> Somebody's got to crack the whip. Hey, Paula. Hey, Rosie. Good to see you guys. So as you guys pop on, would you tell us what city and state you're in and what role you are? I think last time we had almost all ops bosses on the calls, um, but we do also have Rainmakers in the group, and I think a few are signed up this week. So um, as you're popping on, give us your city and give us your um, role on the team, because maybe we can get some referrals generated here. And we'll just give it a couple seconds. It looks like we have people popping on. Hey, Mia, how are you? Casey, good to see you. Um, nobody's commenting, so I don't know whether you can hear me or not. I'm hoping that you can. Can you guys hear us? If you can hear us, comment in the box. Tell us what city you're in, what role you're on on your team before we dive in. I see lots of people joining, but I don't see any comments. There we go, Casey, Savannah, Georgia. Awesome. Okay, so welcome to our second edition of Coffee with Christy and Crew. And we did a poll in the group to find out what you guys wanted to talk about. And the topic that you guys chose this week was leadership and accountability. And um, so the three of us kind of got together and came up with all of our questions, but we wanna hear what your questions are too. And also I wanna remind you that this is a mastermind. So we're just here to kind of guide the conversation. We want you guys to participate in the conversation too. Um, so we're just gonna first, let's introduce ourselves for those of you who were not here last week. So Elizabeth, do you wanna go ahead and start? Yes, Elizabeth Gilbert from Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, Chief Operations Officer for Ron Henderson and Associates. We'll, we are on track for 125 units and 27 million in sales volume this year. Awesome. And Elizabeth is also the coach who um, does our group coaching and training center. So yes. I know some of you on the call are in Elizabeth's group coaching program. So you already know her. And Stephanie. Uh, Stephanie Brackett from Idaho Falls, Idaho and I am the COO of Anderson Hicks Group. We will do somewhere between 800 and 1,000 units this year, depending on whether or not we get our expansion thing going, which I have a CRO who's actually on location today at a possible expansion site. So we'll see how that goes. That's awesome. Um, Boy, what a celebration that'll be, 800 yeah, be super units. Cool. And Stephanie is also um, one of our elite one-on-one -on -one coaches and is a certified Be A Boss trainer. So some of you on the call have probably been in her classes. And then for those of you who don't know me, I'm Christy Belt Grossman. I'm the owner of Ops Boss Coaching. I teach Be A Boss. I also am one of the coaches and super passionate about all things operations. So we are gonna dive right in with the first question. I'm gonna throw the questions out to you guys. And if you have comments that you wanna um, chime in on, feel free to um, chime in on the comments or if you have questions around anything that we're talking about. The idea behind um, the masterminds that we're doing every few weeks is that the three of us often talk to each other and pick each other's brains and challenge each other and like, hey, I'm dealing with this or that. And we thought, why don't we just do this live on Facebook and then we can mastermind together and come up with some um, great discussion and great solutions. So first thing we were gonna talk about is leadership. So leadership starts with us, right? Leadership starts with um, self-mastery. And then accountability flows from that. So um, I had a great quote um, that I found that I loved, which is from a guy from a really long time ago named Plato. Um, and the quote was, for a man to conquer himself is the first and noblest of all victories. So the question that I want to throw out there for all of us is, what does self-leadership look like for you? And then how does accountability fit into that? And we can talk about it in the business sense and the personal sense, because I think they're kind of tied in together. So I don't know if uh, Elizabeth or Steph, one of you guys want to jump in on that. What does yeah, self-leadership look like? I can go first. Awesome. So for, for me, that is, um, I'm an avid book reader. 
and that's where most of my learning comes from. If I want to know something, I find a book on it because I want to dive deep. I'll do a Google search first to find like surface level answer. But if I really want to dive in deep, I will go find a book or ask for recommendations for a certain type of whatever it is that I'm needing in the moment. So if, you know, part of relationships is um, building a, building, building relationships with the people on your team, with the leader above you, um, and everyone around you. And so that was one thing that I was lacking in is that sort of relationships. So that's what I started researching. And think books like Fierce Conversations come up, um, Never Split the Difference. Um, there's a lot of those types of relationship books that have been fundamental in helping me grow. So it's recognizing where I'm struggling and then searching for the answer. And for me, responsibility is my number one strength in the strengths finder. So I take personal responsibility for everything that I do and everything that happens around me because I know that I affect what happens around me. I'm not affected by it. I can only affect myself. So how can I improve myself? That, again. that was really good. Oh God, I don't know if I can. It was uh, so brilliant. I'm like, oh, I okay. affect something about so, I yeah so the things around me don't affect me I affect me right it's only my thoughts and perceptions of what's happening around me so if someone's not doing what I think they should be doing how can I change myself to inspire or motivate or um, lead by example so I have to change me if I want to change what's around me and I do that through books and and learning that way I love that I think um what you said is when I recognize that I need to grow in a certain area, yeah. um, that I'm very purposeful about going about it. And I think that for me is one of the definitions of self-leadership is um, going from E to P, going from that entrepreneurial place to the very purposeful place. Um, and I think it's a challenge as I think a lot of us don't recognize ourselves as leaders and I think before we can recognize ourselves or our team can recognize us as leaders, are we leading ourselves? Mm -hmm. you know, Steph, for you, what does that look like, self-leadership? Um, I'm also an avid reader. I read a ton of books. I think I read almost 50 books last year. It was probably 40, 45 or 46. So I read a lot of books on leadership. But to me, leadership comes with, self-leadership comes with trust. Like I have to trust myself and I, those around me have to trust me. And if I, it's, it's integrity and in doing what I say I'm going to do when I say I'm going to do it, not only when someone's watching, but when someone's not watching, like being that person that's just super, super, um, never, no one ever doubts that if I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. And I have to do that when no one's watching as well. So I have to actually manage and lead myself in that way. Yeah, I think that's really important. I think how many times... I think one of my mistakes that I've made in the past is to hold other people to higher standards than I'm holding myself mm -hmm. to have expectations that my agents are going to come in and lead Jen every single day, no matter what, when, you know what, I'm not working on my 20% every single day, no matter what I'm being distracted to, like, what yeah. does I have to start with me um, first. And so I think for me, that has meant the accountability piece in order for me to lead myself, I have had to put accountability into place and put it in place in a, a, a much stronger way than I used to in the past. Whether that is coaches, um, I have a spiritual director, I have um, over time had a nutritionist, like I need all those pieces to be covered. It's not just the business piece, it's what does my leadership look like in my health? What does it look like in, like Elizabeth said, in my relationships? What does accountability look like for you guys personally and professionally? A uh, lot of different things. Coaching, obviously. Um, I, for me personally, like, like you just talked about, your top 20%, I literally have to call out on Slack every morning to my leadership team, MOT, which is my one thing, MOT, goal for the day. And then I list out what my goal is for the day. And then as soon as one thing times over, 
I call out MOT accomplishments for the day and I call it out. If I don't do that, I'm all over the place during my, my one thing time. Like I have to be super accountable and do they read it? I don't know. I don't care. You know, it's me telling them this is what I'm getting done. And then me having to report back. I don't want to report back that I didn't finish what I said I was going to do. Yeah. I love it's that. I think a lot right. of ops people have that in common that we know if we tell someone else, we're going to do something, we're going to hold ourselves to doing it. We don't necessarily need the other person yep. to follow up, but just the very fact of having that person accountable. I don't know if she's on the call. I don't think she is right now, but I remember, um, uh, Katrina Meistering. So she's uh, director of operations in Maryland. And after she had her third kid, she messaged several of us and said, I need you guys to hold me accountable to texting you a picture of my toes on my scale every single morning, because I'm working on losing the baby weight. And I need that extra accountability from outside. Now, we hardly ever had to remind her to do it. But the fact that she told us she was going to do it, I think pushed her to that next level. Yeah. Um, somebody has asked, now I want you guys too to comment on the same question, like what does self-leadership look like for you and what does accountability look like in your personal and professional life? I'd love to hear from you guys some of that because this is a discussion. And um, somebody came up with a question, what are some of your favorite leadership books? Oh, I love all the John Maxwell ones. I love Dare to Lead by Brene Brown. That one was so good. So good. Yeah. So good. I'm a big fan of 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership. Yeah. Uh, there's an evaluation in there that you can do a self-evaluation. So you can kind of figure out where am I strong and where do I need to grow? And I like taking that evaluation and giving it to the people in my life. Um, where I show up as a leader, whether that's at church mm -hmm. or at work or, you know, whatever. Um, so you can get feedback from other people. That's my favorite one. Yeah. Elizabeth, do you want to add any um, leadership books on top of that? Yeah, the two that I mentioned are probably my, the biggest ones that I've read recently that have had the greatest impact on me, which was Fierce Conversations is all about leadership and even self-leadership, which I like. It's how you talk to yourself. Uh, as well as those around you, and then uh, Never Split the Difference, which is a book about negotiations. It's uh, written by a hostage, FBI hostage negotiator, but he tells you specific phrases and specific techniques to use. And in both of these books, the word empathy comes up quite a bit because until someone feels heard and they feel like you understand them by expressing empathy, it's only then that they'll open up and actually have the deep conversation that, that changes things. We too many times talk about surface level stuff and it's because, and I, I will admit it, I'm not an empathetic person. And that's one thing that I realize is standing in my way of being a better leader. So those two books are a one-two punch for me. I love that. And as you're speaking, it kind of t reminds me another thing that I think is really important in self-leadership that you are very good at. And that is um, looking at yourself objectively. Mm -hmm. It's hard to do that sometimes because we have so many biases, so many experiences, so many weaknesses. But if you can step outside yourself and look at yourself objectively and say, I'm doing this really great and this I could do better. I think that's, that's a form of self-leadership. Um, Cece has a good comment here. I'm going to share. So self-leadership is recognizing when I'm getting overwhelmed, taking a walk to breathe it out and coming back focused on making the immediate adjustments and long-term plan for what's going on. I use the Eisenhower matrix diligently to help me have those conversations with agents as well. I love that the Eisenhower matrix. I share that when I teach be a boss too. Um, so if you guys are on the call and you don't know what that is, just Google it. It'll come up. It's a great way to triage um, what needs your attention and when, mm -hmm. and what doesn't need your attention. Um, Casey said five levels of leadership also agree. Um, so let's dive into, um, did we hit, did we hit accountability? Like what accountability looks like for you personally? Yeah. I think we did. Okay. Yeah. So the next question that came up was, how did you become a leader on your team? Did you grow into being a leader? Were you hired directly into a leadership role? What did that look like? Um, what were the challenges of that? How did you rise to meet them and grow your leadership? So 
I think we have kind of different scenarios here between yeah. us. Elizabeth, you want to start? I have always assumed a leadership role when I see a lack of it. Mm. Like I'm a, I'm a decent follower. Like I, if there is a, someone who is, uh, it's obvious they're in charge and I like the way that they're leading. Like it's a good leader for me. I will follow wholeheartedly. It's when I see a, a hole or where it could be done better is where I step up and fill in the gap and take the pieces that I aren't being done well and figure out a way to do those well. So when I first started ha having no idea what to do in real estate, I just learned everything I could. And then I just assumed the leadership role. Like it wasn't, it wasn't said, okay, Elizabeth, now you're in charge. You know, everything you need to know. You can make decisions on your own. Now you don't need me. It was never like that. It was, I started making decisions and asked for forgiveness later. How did I know which decisions were the ones I could make and the ones I can't? It's because I studied the decisions that had been made in the past and the thought process that went into it from the leader that I was under at the time. And, and came to understand, here's how that person would make that decision. So I'm gonna make that the next decision in the same way. That has always worked well for me. I don't believe there's ever a decision that I've made where the leader came back and said, that is not at all how I would have done that. And you are now banned from ever making any decision ever again. <laughs> like that's never happened. They're appreciative that someone took that off their plate, took the ball and ran with it and just did it. Uh, and Fierce Conversations has that, um, the decision tree, right? The leaf decisions, branch decisions, trunk decision, root decisions. I figured that out naturally. And once I did, I think because I did, other people saw me as a leader and they're like, oh, she's got it. Like, I don't need to worry about her. She knows what she's doing. So that's how I came to it was, um, I think it comes back a little bit to the impatient part where if someone's not going to step up and take charge, I, I almost was the reluctant leader where this isn't right. Someone needs to take care of this. And since no one will step up, I will. I think what was key in that situation, well, a number of things, but one of them that jumps out at me is going back to our first question you see yourself as a leader, yeah. regardless of whether you're the leader right. or a leader, right. you are a leader. And yeah. that's how you show up in any given situation, whether yeah. it's personal or business. It is. I don't need a title. I just do. Yeah. I love that. Um, Steph, what about you? I was actually brought into the team in a leadership role. So there were people working on the team, they didn't have an operations leader at all. They had um, two people working on uh, Fannie Mae foreclosure business and then two people working on the regular business. And I was brought in to lead those people. They didn't have a leader. So um, I was given the title immediately, but that didn't mean I didn't earn the title very quickly. Um, I feel like within you know, a week they were looking to me for answers and how do we do this? And, and the way you gain trust with your people again is doing what you say you're going to do when you say you're going to do it and being self-accountable. Of course, those people look at you and they're like, oh my gosh, she's not messing around. She's totally. And then um, as I was creating systems, it was never, it was never, hey, this is what we're going to do. We're going to do this. It was like, okay, you guys, you've all been doing this and you've been doing this. What's the best way? Let's collaborate for a minute and figure out what the best way. Did I have the final decision? Yeah, I had the final decision on what it was going to look like. But I wasn't just shoving some system that I was going to build down someone's throat or this is the way we're going to do this now or this is how we handle this. It was always a collaborative effort. And I think as a leader, when you allow people to be heard, they feel recognized and they feel, and they will get, you'll get buy-in so much faster. Even if, even if whatever they say isn't incorporated to what you're doing, they just need to, they need to be heard. They need to feel like they're being heard. That they're part of the process, that they matter. Yeah. Well, it goes back to, isn't empathy one of your team values stuff? 
Mm -hmm. um, compassion. compassion. But yes, empathy. Okay, yeah. similar, similar. And it's something similar. I personally, I'm like Elizabeth, I lack compassion. Mm -hmm. I really do. I have to work at it. If someone calls in sick, I'm like, so can you still work? <laughs> like that's what's in my head, right? Because I just work sick. I just come in and keep working. I'm like hacking up along and I'm still working. Yeah. And so I really have to work at it and stop and think, you know, what? oh, I'm so sorry you're not feeling well. Get better soon. We'll handle it. That is not my first initial reaction when someone's. But that's a great example of what we were talking about earlier of going E to P. Part of leadership is going E to P in all those different areas instead of falling back on the default of, well, I'm a high D, whatever, whatever, you know, get over it. And, you know, you've got a laptop. Yeah. Move into the P. <laughs> the awareness, first comes the awareness of where can I grow? And second comes actually taking the action of yeah. how can I grow? And let's yeah. put this into practice. Right. Um, Steph, what were some of the challenges? I know you had some challenges walking into a situation where there were other admin. Um, and I think this happens also on teams where you're, you had the situation when you had two teams merge, but it often happens where maybe there's two admin on a team or three admin on a team and one of them becomes the director of operations. One of them moves into a different role on the team. What were some of the challenges that you had with walking in as a leader instead of um, kind of growing into that position? Uh, in the merged team, are you talking about as we merged the two teams? So th they had their own operations team. Obviously, we had our operations team. First of all, I personally personally believe that my credibility in the market center brought brought me in at a level where they automatically I'd earned trust because I was I was a credible leader in the market center. Like people knew that I did a good job. Um, my team was always easy to work with when we closed transactions. We were you know, nice to people. We were thoughtful. We were considerate. We weren't the person you never want to do a deal with. We weren't those people. So that automatically helped. And I had a relationship. In fact, one of the girls on their team was actually on our original team when I joined Sean. Like wow. one of the people that was still with Mike was one of our foreclosure people when I joined. She had since left the team, was working with Mike. So we had a relationship. Um, and I think, again, it was just allowing them to be heard and, and taking into account all of their, I mean, we're mer merging two systems that are t polar opposites. They're completely opposite. We're merging these teams and these systems and allowing everybody to have say and input and what that was going to look like. I'm not well, just going to force. What's a mistake that you made? Oh, there's lots of mistakes. Um, the biggest mistake I made was not talking about, and if you guys heard the podcast that I did earlier this week, not talking about the unspoken culture that's formed. You have this unspoken culture on a team. We have our core values. Everybody has their core values. And they say, this is, this is what we hire to. This is our culture. There's an unspoken culture that just naturally exists on a team that, that you don't really talk about. And when you merge two teams that have two totally different unspoken cultures, you need to speak that culture. Like that needs to be brought out. So we had a team that did all their communication face to face because they were just all best friends and family and they didn't feel like that was inefficient. And then when we had a team that did their communication all via email because they felt like I'm respecting your time, I'm gonna send it in an email, you can get to it when you want to. And so by not, having that conversation and realizing that we had people thinking you are super inefficient and other people thinking you are super rude. Yeah. Right. Like yeah. we didn't speak that culture and we, and that was a mistake. We, I should have recognized that immediately and had that conversation because I knew, I knew what their culture was and I knew what our culture was. And the thought never crossed my mind, hey, you probably need to talk about this. And I think the same thing happens even within teams. Like you're talking about merging teams, but the same thing can happen with two people on the same team where totally. one has one perception and one has another. So the other question that came in was um, leadership growth plan. And something you just mentioned, I think is a beautiful um, place for especially operations people. I know we have both on the call, but I think we have mainly ops people. Um, what are you doing to exercise that leadership muscle? So for example, in my market center, I was on the ALC for a number of years um, so that I could actually work on my leadership. Um, I also lead retreats for women 
in my church. Um, so I, I'll have a team of 12 people that I lead for 12 weeks um, to prepare to give a weekend retreat. And it helps me develop my leadership in other areas outside of my team so that I can show up stronger as a leader when I was on my team. What other kinds of things are you guys doing to kind of exercise that leadership muscle or to develop your leadership? So for me, um, we have a regional admin mastermind where there's uh, eight offices in our area and um, people in the top 20 percent of the teams in each office, their admin come to a mastermind and their agents go to a separate mastermind. So we get to have a mastermind and I was chosen as leader for that sort of de facto um, just because Again, sometimes when people don't step up, I, I think those who have shown themselves as a leader in other areas are chosen. And although sometimes I am reluctant to take another leadership role on, uh, I, I sometimes feel the need to. So that, that got done, which is totally cool. I appreciate it. Um, and then I'm also uh, sit on the board of a charity as the secretary. And that has been phenomenal. Uh, just seeing a team work like that. It's, you know, we've had the same board members for a long time now, which has been phenomenal. Um, but we get so much done that sitting in that seat has been a great experience. Love that. Um, That's awesome. Yep. Those are my yeah. two main ones. Do you have yeah. anything to add there? Um, for me, a lot of it comes through coaching, like coaching my clients, because if you're going to coach clients, you're going to do the things you're coaching them to do, because yeah. you can't expect someone to do something that you're not willing to do yourself. So a lot of it is that. And then again, church, volunteer church stuff. I do a lot of stuff in volunteer church stuff where I'm in a leadership position, um, at work at our office, we do soup kitchens on Thursdays. I generally take like the leadership role in the soup kitchen, which is the person who's deciding what we're making, cooking, and then directing everybody on what they're doing. So I do a lot of different things like that. But like you said, Elizabeth, I'm kind of a naturally born leader. And if I see a lack, I step right in. Yeah, I love that. And I think there's a lot of opportunity for growth in those areas. Um, I think a lot of us are very involved in other things but we hold back a little bit sometimes. Yeah. And so one of the things that I had to do with myself, you guys know I'm an introvert, is really push myself to step to the next level of leadership yeah. instead of being the supporting leader to be the leader leader, right? And it, it stretched me a little bit beyond um, my norm. So and I'll tell you, something that helps with that is even just teaching classes in your office. Like, and it can be something very, very simple, very basic. You have to think there's agents that join the office who don't know how to keep their files. Well, if you've even been in an admin role for six months, you know how to keep files. So volunteering to teach a class immediately elevates you to leader. Like there's, you have, you're an authority in that area, even if you're only six months ahead of somebody else. Yeah. So, and that's getting you outside of your comfort zone. If you're not used to standing in front of people that can push your leadership lid even higher. And I would also suggest to people too, that, you know, that there, I know there's a lot of people on this call who are strong leaders. I'm, I'm scrolling down the names on Facebook. And if you're not already mentoring somebody who's in an admin role, somewhere around the country, it can be in your office, it could be somebody you meet on Facebook, step up into that role. The Facebook group is a great way to work on your leadership. When you see someone post a question, go, hey, I'd love to talk to you about that and pick up the phone and have a conversation with them. Like that's another way to raise your leadership lid. Um, and just, I think, participating in your market center too in a lot of different things. Like your market center is a great place outside of your team like I've developed a super close relationship with our director of agent services, our assistant MCA that cuts all the checks. Like, I mean, just volunteering to teach Ignite when they're trying to find someone to teach the contract to close class for Ignite. You yeah, know what? Too. That's me. I'll do it every time you ask me and I'll do it every single time that you yeah. ask me to just being, being really helpful in the market center. 
Agree. Totally agree. Lots of opportunities there. So let's talk about um, the shotgun seat. So many of us on the call are riding shotgun, meaning we're kind of the secondary partner leader on our team. What does that look like for you? How is that different from leading as the team owner? And, um, you know, let's just chat about that a little bit. Who wants to dive in there? And you guys I always say that Sean and I share a brain. So, I mean, we have a couple oh leaders gosh. on our team just because of the way our team's structured. We have Sean, who's the CEO, and he's my original mega. So he and I have a super close relationship. And then we have Mike Hicks, who's an owner, but he's still in production. But of course, he owns half the team, so he's still there. And then we have our CRO, Chris, so he's over the sales team. And so I'm kind of sitting four in a, we're kind of sitting all four in a car all the time when we're making these leadership decisions right you guys are rotating seats i think all the time we do we do yeah. sean's usually driving and i'm actually usually in the passenger seat mike's along for the ride because he's he's got he, we need that man to sell he'll sell stuff so we just need him to sell and then give us his opinion on decisions we're making and then chris is running the sales team but i mean it's it's interesting the more you develop um a really close relationship, the more invaluable you come become to your leader. And, and Sean will always say, he'll say, you know, we'll help you having problems with someone. He'll be like, well, you know, everyone's replaceable except you, please don't ever leave me. You're not replaceable. Please don't leave. Right. So you want to be that person. I love when he says that to me, because I really feel like I am a partner in our business. I'm not just his COO. I am actually a partner. He wouldn't dream of making a decision without me. He just wouldn't. So let's, let's dig into that a little bit, because I don't think everybody has that situation. Like if I'm on a team and I feel like there isn't great leadership or maybe my agent's a great salesperson, they haven't, they're learning how to be a business person and maybe they haven't evolved to being a great leader yet. How can I facilitate that process? What is my role? How do I earn trust? Like all those questions usually come up from people. Well, our relationship wasn't always like that. You know, for the first three or four years that we were, that wasn't our relationship. And I, and over the years, I've just continued to coach him on areas where I feel he's lacking. And he coaches me on areas where he feels I'm lacking. So we've had those conversations and they've been some pretty fierce conversations. What does that and sound like when what you're, does that like? what does that sound like when you're coaching him on something that you see that he could use some improvement on? Yeah. Without um, saying you suck. Yeah. <laughs> I'm being dumb. <laughs> um, you know, honestly, it ha you have to use tact because none of them want to hear. No one ever wants to hear you're doing something wrong. Like yeah. literally everybody's going to go onto the defensive. So generally when I'm trying to coach him through that, it's like, hey, I don't know that I would have handled that the same way. I can see why you did it. In my opinion, we might have been more effective had we done this. And he'll say, well, what do you mean? And I'll say, and then we'll just, it'll open up a dialogue and we'll start talking. I don't ever say, you really handled that crappy dude. That was right. awful. That was the worst <laughs> you ever made. It's like, in my opinion, I think we probably could have handled that a little bit better. Here's what I think we should have done. Sometimes he'll say, I don't think you're right. I think that this is what we needed to do. And he'll lay out his argument and say whatever he needed to say. And I'll say, okay, you're probably right. Or I'll say, okay, we're going to agree to disagree. I don't believe that's how it was handled. And I mean, that's just how we exist. We have an open enough relationship to be able to talk like that, but it took years of building trust and him truly, truly trusting me and always knowing that I had the company's best interest in mind. Always. It wasn't about me. Right. It wasn't about what I wanted. It was always what was best for the company. Always. I think sometimes um, when people are having that struggle of we're not having those in-depth conversations, that a good place to go back to is the expectations conversations from Career Visioning. Yeah. Pull out that worksheet. You know, lots of us came onto our teams before Career Visioning existed, um, and it's a good reset button. Like, how do you want to be communicated with? If I have a big important thing to talk to you about on a scale of one to 10, how direct do you want me to be? 
give me an example of what a 10 looks like, that kind of thing. I think we have to have a conversation sometimes with each other as leaders to say, do you want me to hold you accountable? How do you want me to hold you accountable? To what do you want me to hold you accountable? Um, and, and then the same thing back. I think sometimes on the operation side, we expect to be held accountable by our leader, but we don't always realize that, guess what? Our leader may also expect us to hold them accountable, and we should have a conversation about what that looks like. Some yeah. may not want that accountability, and some may. And I think you guys were able to get to a place to have a really deep, meaningful conversation that sometimes um, people in our role are not always courageous enough to have. Yeah. yeah and true. I think that conversation you had changed your whole relationship. Ron and I had the same, have the same relationship. And in fact, I think Ron and um, Stephanie, your CEO has probably been talking to each other because they say the exact same things. <laughs> <laughs> like Elizabeth, you, you know, he, they, he said the exact same thing. Everyone else on this team is replaceable except you. Like you can't leave, you can't quit. Um, so if my leader doesn't, show leadership, what else can I do? The, the tactic that I have used, which has worked pretty well uh, because it works well for me, is that if I see something that Ron needs to improve on, I will go do the research and find the book or find the podcast and find out how to grow in that area myself and then I will take that to him and say, you know, I was listening to this podcast and they said X, Y, Z thing. And I know that, you know, I think that'd be really cool if we did that on our team. What do you think that would look like? And then we go down that path. So it's not necessarily me saying you need to improve in that area. It's me bringing him an idea or a solution or something cool, again, with always the understanding that I'm constantly looking to make our team better. And I have the team's best interest at heart. And I think that helps it him, uh, it makes it easier for him to listen to and be open to it rather than me saying, well, I just think you need to get better at that. Love it's that. funny because I can remember reading a book. It's probably been, oh gosh, it's probably been five years. And I'm reading this book and I don't even remember what book it was. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's Sean. Oh my gosh, that's Sean. And it's talking about leadership failures, right? <laughs> like bad things. And I'm like, oh my gosh. Oh, no. I'm like, you should read this book. Like it's such a great <laughs> book. You should read this book. So he like starts to read it and he's like messaging me. He's like, that's the stupidest book I've ever read in my life. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. So you should read my copy of the book because I, I, <laughs> so I, I like where way. you went with that, though, Elizabeth, to start with you. Yeah, because I think sometimes we start with frustration with our leader and our leader isn't where they should be. Right. But we have to start with us yeah, as leaders. Sure. Right. Yeah. So yeah. I want to transition a little bit into accountability because we said we were going to talk about leadership and accountability. What does accountability look like on your team? Why do we even have that word accountability? Who's responsible for it? When and how often does it happen? Is there a format, a structure for that? Like, what does that look like? Uh, it can be so many things on different teams. And I'd love for you guys to chime in on that too. Like, what does accountability look like on your team? What are you struggling with? What are you successful with? So I'll throw that out there to you guys first while we're waiting for them to answer. Well, you last week for those people that were on saw our, um, or last month, our reports, like we have very horizontal visibility. Um, Chris, our CRO hates the word accountability. He just doesn't like that word. I don't know why, but he, he <laughs> visibility is what he calls it because oh when people God. personally hold themselves accountable, he yeah. doesn't want to hold people accountable. I he like that people. visibility versus accountability. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. So we use visibility. So we have very open visibility across and everybody knows if someone's struggling, like you can see it in the numbers, the numbers don't lie. So on our team, the visibility is the biggest, the biggest form of accountability that we have. Everything's just shared. It's just open. It goes out every day. Everybody sees the reporting. So, I mean, that's the way we hold people to the team standards. Okay. Elizabeth? We've adopted that. Uh, I will say that one thing that 
because Ron is such an accountable person for himself, he doesn't like other people holding him accountable and he doesn't like holding other people accountable. He doesn't like being the person who, you know, comes in and says, why haven't you made your phone calls? He hates that. And so the level of accountability on our team has been lacking. And so we went to the visibility tactic where I put the numbers now on the team meeting report um, every week. In fact, having since having our last conversation, I've changed how I report those numbers. And now the agents are ranked based on what they have in pending, what they have upcoming, what they have closed um, in units and in volume. So now that has brought out some competition in them and now they're competing. And that happened, all I had to do was put the numbers and make it visible. And now they see where they're at. And the ones at the bottom are going, crap, I gotta get my button gear. What can I do, Ron? Help, you know, where can I lead generate? What can I do? And then we've also started doing the, uh, unless your tasks are up to date, you're out of lead rotation. So at the beginning of the day, Ron will look and see who has outstanding tasks. And he says, these people are available for leads today. And then that goes out. And the people who aren't available get their rear and gear and get caught up. Yeah, transparency is definitely productive. Yes. Yeah. So what do you guys do? How do you get buy-in? These are the other questions. How do you get buy-in for accountability and standards? What happens when people are not accountable or are not meeting standards? And how do you handle that? I know a lot of people struggle with that. So what does that look like on your teams? Ours just goes back to visibility. I mean, when that daily report comes out, it says who's in lead rotation or not. The ISAs know immediately who they're setting appointments for. for. The agents want to have appointments set for them. That is money in the bank for them. So when they can see every day and, and the reports go out daily, so they know who's in rotation, we can pull a report or we can look at the report that comes out that says, how many days has this agent been in rotation this month? So we know if someone's been in rotation two days the whole month, what are they doing? So what, what happens in that situation when you see that on a report? Like, do you have yeah, a that's a, yeah, that's a personal conversation with our CRO. And then if it continues, I mean, if they fall below the three per three deals a month, that is the team standard, they will self-select off. We've lost agents because they weren't doing that. In fact, our reporting is, I feel like now our reporting is so all encompassing. We can tell based on the numbers who's already quit. They just haven't left yet. Mm -hmm. and we just help them with that conversation. So we had an agent about two months ago, two or three months ago, and it was on our leadership radar. We're like, he's quit. He's literally quit. He just hasn't left. And so he came into Sean's office one day and said, hey, can I talk to you for a minute? And Sean's like, sure. And we'd been talking about it for three weeks in a row. Hey, this guy, we think that something's going on, something's going on. And he's like, Chelsea and I have been thinking about going out on our own. And that's his wife. They were a team. And Sean said, okay, we'll just make today your last day then. Like he didn't even give him the option. It wasn't, we're thinking about like, oh no, please stay. We knew he'd quit three weeks ago. It wasn't even worth trying to continue to pull. Don't, the numbers don't lie. They told us everything we so need. So let's then talk about, because I, I think what happens is the bigger your team grows, the easier and better the visibility, horizontal accountability, transparency, whatever word you want to use, works, right? Because everyone rises to the top yeah. and those who don't fall away. The challenge is when you're a smaller, younger team, um, I think what I have seen is there's a fear of loss. So there's totally. a fear of putting in standards. There's a fear of holding people accountable to the standards because if I don't, I'm gonna lose my agents. And I think the answer to that is top grading and hiring more agents so yes. that everyone rises and the lower slips yes. away. But that takes a lot. It's very easy for us, I think, as operations people to say, that's what we should do. Like Rainmaker, why don't you hire better agents? Yeah. Well, what can I look at it and say, what can we do as leaders on the team to 
to aid the rainmaker in making that happen. As a director of operations, are you bringing talent to your rainmaker? Are you connecting people that you meet in your community that you think would be great agents or agents that are on other sides of transactions if you're the TC? I think it's very easy for us to make that criticism and not participate in the solution. Yeah, I, I will say that say having been through that um, here recently, that was a huge, um, that was a huge stumbling block. Like that was a that was a ceiling that we kept hitting our head against. And both Ron and I had heard, you know, to get past us, you just need to hire more agents. But that didn't uh, that didn't compute. Like I don't have enough leads for more agents. I don't understand how that works. How am I going to keep them fed when I don't have enough leads coming in? And I'll tell you the solution that finally got us past that. And we're talking about where Ron was still taking all of the listings and he had a buyer's agent that he was giving all of his buyers to. So we ended up hiring another buyer's agent to work in another um, part of the city. She ended up doing listings in that area too because Ron didn't wanna drive out that far for listing appointments. So now she's doing both. When she made that transition to doing both, Ron finally got it in his head that he doesn't have to go on every single listing appointment because he taught her how to take listings. And when he realized, oh my goodness, someone else can take listings on this team, that was the trigger point that let him hire a listing specialist. And when he got a taste of not going on listing appointments mm -hmm. anymore and realizing that he now had more time to lead generate for agents, that's when the team started to grow in number. And that's when we started to realize that the leads will continue to come in. And if we market to our sphere of influence and past clients, we have enough people in there to pass off to the agents on our team, as well as help them market to their sphere. And that is what has been uh, instrumental in bringing in business to the team that we would not have had otherwise. Okay. So to cut people off from leads, that are coming in is only cutting them off from our past clients, our, you know, whatever comes in from our marketing efforts. They still have the option to call their own past clients and get business off of that. They're not out of the lead rotation from that. So, and to think that the majority of the leads that they do get are still coming from us in our market. It's about two thirds and one third is coming from them. So getting over that hump came in the form of how does Ron stop working in the business completely? He's not picking up the phone and calling people anymore, um, although he is because that's the part of the job he loves most. But he's not going on the appointments anymore. He hands off appointments, he hands off leads, and he quit doing so much of that. And that was a mindset shift. I had to help him get there. And for me, that was introducing the idea of kind of saying how, what would your days look like if you quit going on listing appointments? Because you're doing those, you know, four or five o'clock at night, and I know you don't get home till about eight. And so how would it be if you were home every night with your wife and she could make you, you know, her magnificent lasagna? And he, like, he bought into that. Tell, I'm telling you, the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. So bring up food, right? No. And no, so you mentioned something really key, which is understanding people's big why. Yeah. I think that's part of a role of the leader is understanding their big why. Mm -hmm. And so if you have an agent who's maybe growing into their leadership, they're not there yet, you can help them grow into that like by yep. coming into their big why. Yep. Um, well, so on the accountability side. I think you can't make people accountable, right? You can only yeah. hire accountable people. So how are you guys digging into that, measuring that um, kind of vetting for accountability in, in your hiring process on your team, whether that's admin or agent? History, job history, successful success on the job, and then the references 3D. We're, we are definitely- but how specifically are you digging into that 
for the account, like you're looking at trajectory and you're looking at success on the job, that measures a lot of different um, areas. How are you digging into whether they are, are an accountable person that wants to be held accountable or that holds themselves accountable? Depends on their job history. Most people that are successful in, in sales roles, even not real estate, if they're successful in a sales role, they are accountable people. They are selling, they're working off a commission. They're not getting paid to just sit there. The people that got paid regardless of whether they worked or not, it's a lot harder to tell if they're an accountable person. But most people that we hire have a very long history of, we've had cell on phone sales. On the Yeah, on the so agent what side. about on the admin side? Because we're looking for accountable people in all positions on our team. How are you digging into accountability in your interview process for operations people? I think the CV process has a lot of stuff in there about accountability. Like, I feel like a lot of the questions are like, tell me about a time when you had to do this. Tell me about a time. And, and a lot of their language, you can tell if they, well, my boss told me to do this and I didn't think that was the right thing to do. And you can tell based on their language, what type of person they are, if they're combative or if they're blaming or it, it's really yeah. easy to tell. I, I think personally, I, I don't know. Sometimes you just have to have a, a knack for it <laughs> and trial and error. What else would you add to that? Yeah. What's that? What else would anything to add to that on the hiring side? I really do enjoy the question. How long are you willing to fail, fail at something until you succeed? Because I think that reveals mindset a lot. And it's surprising. Um, one of the agents that self-selected out, uh, actually in the last couple of weeks on our team, I went back and was thinking about how he answered that question. And um, he the example that he gave was something like ridiculous. And um, because it was something about his pool, oh, his pool chemicals. He didn't wanna hire someone to um, help him with the pool chemicals because he figured he could figure it out himself. and in the course of an entire summer, he still hadn't figured it out, but he still wasn't gonna hire a pool chemical guy, right? And I was like, okay, well, this guy has some tenacity, um, you know, and maybe he'll get it next year. And then at, looking back, I'm like, what the hell was I thinking? Like, <laughs> and knowing now what I know about him, this is the fail forward moment of, well, there's your answer right there, Elizabeth. <laughs> So that's why I like that question. And now I will pay more attention to it moving forward. I think that's really good. I think there's a lot of times we don't pay attention to the question. We ask a great question and we don't really pay attention, pay attention to, the to the answer. We had at one point someone on, the, on a team I was on who was a lead buyer agent. And in our career visioning process, which was recruit select at the time, he said that he had left his previous job because he just didn't want to be accountable to a nine to five kind of thing. I want to be able to play golf and blah, blah, blah. And we completely ignored that. And it turned out that accountability was a major issue um, on the team. I like to just ask a simple question of, um, let's take the word accountable. Tell me, like, what are your thoughts around the word accountable? Mm. For some people, they'll say, oh my God, accountability, like I hate people micromanaging me and they'll go on to this whole negative thing about accountability. When you ask talent what accountability kind of means to them, they'll be like, oh my God, I crave accountability. I know I need accountability in order to reach my goals. Like, can you tell me what accountability looks like on your team? Because it's really important to me. Like the answers you get will be all around that question. Mm -hmm. um, so that seems almost like too simple of a question. Um, okay, we have some questions. So Joellen has a question. Joellen, I hope you're healing up, by the way. Bless you. Um, she says, we're a newer team since February, made up of three agents that had only been individual agents and me. I was previously on a team of five. The biggest challenge we have is getting in a groove of consistency, just getting started, trying to figure out what the baby steps would be. So what would you guys kind of suggest for baby steps to getting on the path to consistency? Uh, that's a great question. I mean, we had so many different 
things coming at us when we merged teams, like a million things that needed our attention. Mm -hmm. And so we were really purposeful about creating our issues list, which is this giant thing. And issues aren't bad. It's just an issue. It's something that needs to be solved. What are we doing about this? What are we doing about this? What are we? And then every single leadership meeting being really purposeful about, okay, which ones do we need to identify, discuss, and solve today? Which ones do we just need to acknowledge that they exist and we're choosing not to do them right now? We have a really comprehensive list. So capturing everything that's coming up as some sort of open loop in our system or process, just capturing them and then figuring out which ones need attention immediately and tackling those. And we've probably knocked out, if I had to guess, I bet somewhere in the range of 150 different issues that were on our list, we have solved and moved on. So if you're a brand new team and we're talking about leadership and accountability today, and you've got three agents that are used to doing their own thing in their own world, they're all like these planets, all in different, how do you kind of rein in the kittens? Where do you start? Like, what would you say to her for, we need to be consistent. Where do we start? Come into the office at the same time every day, Monday through Friday, no exceptions. We're all going to be agree to be there at eight or eight 30 at nine o'clock, whatever the time is and show up every day because showing up is one of the biggest things that will get you in the right direction. Decisions are so much easier to make when you're all together for one because they're there to ask. And training at the same time every day makes sense. Lead generation at the same time every day makes sense. So the one thing that I love being consistent about is being in the same place at the same time all together every day. And until you establish that pattern of what you're gonna do for the rest of your day, just start the day together. And then you can figure it out from there. I love yeah, that. I love that. that. That's too. awesome. I would agree with that too. And it's okay. easy. And then figure out your big rocks. Like figure yeah. out, okay, what does lead gen look like? And solve that problem. What does our lead gen look like? Solve that problem once and for all, and then move on. What does lead intake look like? When we get a brand new lead, what does that look like? Solve that and move on. Yeah. Yeah. So I would say probably that starts with um, some conversation. If you're a small team with just a couple agents, it starts with you as the EA with your rainmaker talking about where do we want to start? What do we want this to look like? What's our first rock? Yeah, what are we tackling? I mean, you go, I, I like to go back to the one thing question. What's the one thing that if I did it, everything else would be yep. easier or unnecessary? Yep. Start and answer that question with your rainmaker and then kind of build, I would build from there. Yeah. Um, do you guys, do you guys have other questions that you want to pop in? I think we're kind of bumping up to the end of, um, our time and I forgot I was going to give away a book. Hold on. It's right here. Have you guys read this yet? I have not. Oh, yes. Yeah. We read that this first quarter. It's a great book. So, nice. Here we go. If, um, I'll give it to somebody who's on the call. I think I probably should give it to Cece today because Cece has commented with a whole bunch of great comments today. I did not read all of them. If we didn't get to your answers, I will post back in there. Um, I will post another poll also. So we want to know, like, what else do you guys want to talk about? Um, I'm not sure when our next one is going to be because guess what, you guys, if you've been in my class, you know where I'm going in five for, I don't know how many days. On Sunday, I'm leaving for Paris for a month. So you may get Stephanie and Elizabeth without me, or we may take a pause depending on, we haven't talked about schedules yet, but we'll figure that out. If you um, are going to still be registering for Ops Boss Leader Retreat, prices are going up August 30th. So now is the time to do that. And if you are an alum, message me for the discount code so that you can get a discount. And what else did I forget? We're getting ready to start a new session up of um, our group coaching, which starts September, what is it, Elizabeth? September, I don't know, third, I think? Uh, September. Right after third. Labor Day. Third, it is third. So if you're interested in that, message us. And I think I covered everything. So thank you guys so much for participating. Um, you guys say some prayers for Joellen. She had, um, uh, I forget if you had a fall or what it was, but she's healing up. 
And we'll see you next time on Coffee with Christy. Thanks for coming on. Thanks, you guys, for joining me, Elizabeth and stuff. Absolutely. Bye. See you guys next time. Bye. Bye.